I don't, I honestly, respectfully, I could care less about politics. I, I hear young people, oh, I'm not into politics. Well, politics is into you and politics is a stalker. Right. <laughs> Right now, if you make more than $6,600 a year, Georgia considers you too rich for health insurance. Hold on, say, hold on, wait. Yes, what? we've got someone who currently has the job who does not believe in a woman's right to choose, refused to invest money in health care. He hasn't tackled the tough issues. And if you're okay with those decisions, then you should stay home. But if you believe that we deserve more, then vote for someone who's willing to do more and who has proven that she'll do it. Right. Yo, what's good? What's poppin'? What it is, what it ain't, what it could be, what it should be, what it would be. It is Cam Newton, the son, Mr. Boogie to all. And I'm here to give good content for the masses and to promise to keep it funky for your asses. Now, the reason why I whisper is because I'm in the midst of greatness. Now, I told her that I was extremely nervous. Not that I get nervous. I make people nervous. But today, I <sighs> got bit by the bug. I have the honor and the pleasure of speaking to an author, have a, the pleasure of speaking to a uh, business owner. I have the pleasure of speaking to a lawyer, uh, amongst many other things, and hopefully the next governor of Georgia. Thank you. Ms. Stacey Abrams, how are you? I am quite well, thank you for asking. How are you? Now listen, I am, Phenomenal. Thank you for giving me the most expensive thing anybody can give, and that's time. Thank you. Um, and I told you off camera that what, what I want to do, just in, in, no different than any other guest, is really humanize them in a way that I'm able to bring something out of them that nobody probably ever has gotten, and it can be something as simple as, oh, I really like popcorn, or I really like this, or I really like that. So as we're talking about it, as I was looking into, you know, the history of your evolution, right? The author, the romantic novelist. Yes. Please enlighten me <laughs> to, we all see the State of the Union, right? Very articulate. You represent the culture and a people so proudly, right? Uh, how did we come up with that, or, or what, what, what kind of sparked that interest? So I'm the, my mom was a librarian when I was growing up, so I loved reading. I've been mm. reading since my earliest memory. I actually tried to write a romance novel when I was in middle school, but... What? Yeah, it was really short, because I couldn't date till I was 16, so it really, oh. I was missing a lot of the context. Okay, But I okay. uh, watched a lot of General Hospital and, uh, mm. you know, One Life to Live as a Child. But always loved romance. Used to read romance novels with my sisters, mm. and I have a, a great aunt who passed away. She used to just collect them. Mm. When I was in law school, I wanted to write a book, okay. and I'd always wanted to write a book. The book I wanted to write was actually based on my ex-boyfriend's dissertation. He was a chemical physicist. What? Yes. What's his name? So I can. Well, his name is Derek Williams. He's actually in the book in prison uh, because it was a bad breakup. Um, we broke up long before I used to. But this is fictional or non-fictional? For real, he is a chemical physicist. In fiction, he is in prison in the book because I was still bitter when I wrote the book. Oh. Um, I mean, we were friends by then because yeah. I was, but you know. How did he feel about that? He understood why. I'll he, say less. He, 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 he knows why he's in there. Okay. He, so I wanted to write a romance novel. I wanted to write a spy novel. Okay. But it was the late 90s and black writers couldn't get published in espionage. Mm. Um, just think about it. There, there were no black spy novelist, and right. then the only places where black women really could get published in mass fiction was romance. So I made my spies kill all the same people they were gonna kill, but I made them fall in love, and it became a romance novel. And that's how I started writing romance. Listen here. <laughs> well, we can end it right there, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> we got some, because I never would have know, uh, you know, known that, but more importantly, just for you to be able to, you know, being, a public official or being a person of influence, right? I'm pretty sure you've seen your life change <laughs> in, a, in a blink of an eye, right? What are the perks of it, of it? And what's the bad things about it as well? So I am an introvert okay. in the truest sense of the word. I really, 
I appreciate the access I have. I appreciate my ability to engage people, mm -hmm. but I'm I'm kind of quiet and private. Okay. And so the the challenge has been that I can't be that way as much as I used to. I I spend a lot of time in public spaces in ways that had I thought about it, I probably wouldn't have been right. like, huh. Normally, in, in yeah. normal circumstances. I would be watching a, you know, a Star Trek marathon by myself. Wow. Yes. But the, the upside is that, and the benefits of what, I mean, look, I got to be on Star Trek. So yeah. I, that, was, that was fun. But there's, a, there's an access that's created to people and to conversation mm -hmm. sometimes you never imagine. Right. And as someone who really is in public service because I care about people, yes. it's been truly a fantastic opportunity for me to get to just engage people in really different ways. Right. Uh, things I don't think I would do, people I don't think I would meet, I get to meet and I get to do. And I'm a better person every time I get to engage with people, even if we disagree. Right. And so, you know, yes, you give up privacy, you give up alone time, but you gain access you get to you know live out your childhood dreams of walking on you know the I get to I got to descend uh, from a spacecraft so you know that was kind of cool. So you're you're a very sci-fi preferable show watcher. No, I watch everything now. Sci-fi. I love science fiction. Okay. But I have a deep and almost religious commitment to television. Okay. Yeah. So take us there <laughs> to your. If we still had TV Guide, yes, right, which we don't. That's well, we sad. have it in social media form or whatever <sighs> because of Twitter or Instagram. What would be the top three most visited TV networks or shows or series or movies in Miss Abrams' catalog? So right now, uh, I, I curate kind of differently. So I just finished watching Eureka, which is a sci-fi show that okay. I missed when it came out, but ended up binge watching the last, the full five episodes, five seasons. Mm. But yesterday I watched uh, the FBI, uh, they come on CBS, so mm -hmm. FBI, FBI Most Wanted, FBI International. I will watch the three Law and Orders that just premiered because it just, it's back. I need the Equalizer to come back. Uh, Abbott Elementary, which is really important. Oh, yes. I and I am waiting till uh, I get some time so I can catch up with Rick and Morty because the new season is out and I need to see it. But I've already watched the, late, the, le the latest season of Solar Opposites, which is also quite good. So we have a lot of time on, my, on our hands. That's what we're trying to say. But even then, I think what's, what's most important for me and that I do a due diligence for you is to bring out, like I said, the humanistic side. Because oftentimes I've been guilty or have been kind of thrusted on a platform and people forget that you're human too. If somebody were to rush me and, and slap me or say hurtful things to me, I'm not bulletproof. You know what I mean? And when a person may say, oh, she got all that time to do all this and do all that, how she going to help our community? Well, how would you say or how would you answer that question? One, I love television because it is a great way to decompress. Mm -hmm. Any person who tells you they don't take time for themselves, something's going to... A, a, it's gonna burst out somewhere. Right. And so I can either decompress by letting myself read and watch television, mm -hmm. or I can let it spill out in other ways that aren't beneficial to others. So for me, right. that's, you know, the, the phrase is self-care. Uh, people can use different phrases to describe it, but for me, it's one of the ways I help myself come back to me. Mm -hmm. Number two, I spend most of my time thinking about how I can do good for others, and it should never be a distraction yes. to take care of yourself when your mission is to help others. And, and that can sound you know, very highfalutin and self-aggrandizing, and I don't mean it that way. For me, it's about, I understand people better because I know what it means when you have all of this time taken right. from you and you get one hour, what do you decide to watch? Correct. Are you gonna do the Food Network so you can do four other things while you're listening yeah. to Bobby Flay, you know, figure out how to make, you know. You know some type of soup. Some, some pierogi, yeah. exactly. Or are you going to spend this time doing something else? And for me, it, to your point about humanization, I want elected officials who actually understand what real life is like. Yes. And I'm, I'm very real. Right. <laughs> like, and I feel it. Matters. <laughs> and, and I think we need as a people, and I'm not talking about no age, race, ethnicity. I'm talking about 
American people, more specifically Georgians, need people who are in positions of power that are tapped in to it. And I think I could speak to this when you're so used to, when you're so used to pouring in other people's cup, it's so important for you to find ways to fill your cup up because it's not fair. At, at the end of the day, you know, my mom always says, what color is your battery? You know what I mean? And it's like, man, my battery's, you know, green today, mom. Oh, I ain't gonna lie to you, mom. It's yellowish red, you know. But we want to operate off of premium, you know, um, time that, you know, we know that Miss Abrams, she's getting the best version of myself. You know, my son, he's getting the best version of myself. My, my, my significant other, my family, my friends, my loved ones, like they are getting the best version of myself. And the only way I'm able to do that is if I'm charged up and if I'm refilled. You know, I think for you, you represent so much being a, du a double minority, right? An African-American who is a female, proudly so, do you, or what do you think of where women are in positions of power and where would you like for, you know, you to see that? Women have made incredible strides. Black women have made remarkable strides, but there are still places we are either not admitted to or one of us gets to stick our head in and the rest of us are told, we let one of you in, go away. Mm. And so there's never been a black woman governor in the history of the United States. In 246 years, not a single black woman has ever been elected to the highest executive office at the state level. And your eyes are really big. And the reality is it, it's a consequence of how we think about women's leadership and black women's leadership in particular. Black women have made strides as mayors. Uh, we've had a U.S. Senator, we've got a vice president, but getting black women into the position of power that has the most direct control over our daily lives, that's what the governor is. Most people know the presidency, they know the mayor, but it's the governor who decides how funds are allocated for education, for housing, for health care, for how you make your living. And we've never had a black woman in that position. When I was the nominee in 18, I became the first black woman in American history to even be nominated. Mm. And the fact that that wait, waited until 2018 right. is concerning. And so I think while we have made progress, we can never rest on our laurels because the places where we are not permitted, the places we have not uh, been able to advance into are often the spaces where we need to be the most. Right. For me, the issue of reproductive care, that's a, that's a governor's decision the issues of mass incarceration, that's, dis that's often determined by governors. Whether or not we have affordable housing, that's what the governors help direct. All of those conversations that we're having at the kitchen table or in the car, the conversations we're having during commercial, right. those conversations are often driven not by who the president is and not by who the mayor is, but by who the governor is. And so for me, it is a critical job that so few people understand, but it controls so much right. of the outcomes of our lives. Right, so even with that, I think I commend you for being so, uh, or just persevering through so much adversity. And I only can imagine what you go through on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but why do you keep <laughs> going and going? Like, I, I wanna hear from you because this is not your first time running for governor. It is not. Right? And I think people, not only myself, but for the viewer just to see like, listen, hey, you know, this is something that I believe in. This isn't something that I know change is near and I want to be that change, right? So what keeps you uh, replenished? What keeps you, you know, pushing towards like what you want and not giving up, so to speak? So I told you I'm the, my parents, my mom was a librarian, my dad was a shipyard worker. My parents were working poor. Like they worked full time, but could never. He was a longshoreman? Uh, so a shipbuilder, okay. so a shipyard worker. So he, he worked his way up, yes. but you know, longshoreman had labor unions. Yes. <laughs> he didn't. And so when my dad got hurt on the job, they refused to pay his workers comp. My mom was basically the primary breadwinner when my dad was delivering pizzas, trying to you know, get mm. his, literally get his body back in shape because he, he broke his back and they wouldn't pay his workers comp. And so I grew up in a space where we had so little and even before my dad got hurt, there, was, there were ch economic challenges. But my parents made us volunteer. Mm. They would take us out to volunteer every week because 
they would tell us, my dad's way of saying it is, having nothing is not an excuse for doing nothing. Mm. Your job was to help other people because no matter how bad your life was, there's someone who had a story you didn't know right. and they needed you. And for me, that was why I ran for governor because I've had this extraordinary privilege. I got to go to Spelman College and Texas for grad school and Yale for law school. I got to be an attorney and a writer. But not any of those things were, were predicted. They were because my parents raised me to think that you you try, and if you don't succeed, try again. Mm -hmm. You plan, you educate yourself, you do what you can. And when you have setbacks, you don't let those set you back. You, you acknowledge it and you find the next thing to do as long as your mission remains. Right. And so when I ran for governor, my mission was to serve the people of Georgia and make sure that the millions of people who watch everyone else get more and they don't want every, They don't want to take anything from anyone. Mm -hmm. They just want to be able to take care of themselves, take care of their families, but they can't figure out why it hasn't worked or why it's so hard. I know what the answer is. I know what government can do if it works well. And when I applied in 18 and didn't get the job, mm -hmm. it would have been, for me, there was never a question of giving up because I said this is what I wanted to do, so my job was to figure out how do I do it. Mm -hmm. And so in the four years when I didn't have the job, I found ways to help people with healthcare, to help them with access to their businesses. I helped pe folks, I paid off medical debt for folks. I did all of the things that I could do without the job, but the work that can still be done is so critical, and the people who need that work are still here. Right. We have a 20% poverty rate among our children in Georgia, 14% mm. poverty, but we also have people in the middle class who are barely hanging on or who just wanna do a little bit better for their kids. Right. They need someone who, who's there to help them. And that's all government is. Government is us coming together to help each other. So the very, it's a very long way of saying, I don't quit because I actually believe that my job is to serve. Mm. My parents are ministers. They were called to save people's souls. I don't, I don't have that kind of patience or time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my goal is to help people's lives get better. And I can't, can't solve your problems for you, but I can move some of the obstacles out of the way and help you feel, build the roadmap to get you where you want to go. Right. And we have that in common. Uh, my father's a preacher. Right. So being raised in ministry is something that, you know, we can we can honestly say we've both been dipped in the blood yes. from the cloth. Yes. Now, I don't know what your experience was, but my experience was church was a day. Yes. It wasn't just an event. You know, what I mean, uh, I think we're my question. And I don't I don't mean to be political. I don't I don't I honestly, respectfully, I could care less about politics. Mm -hmm. Uh, because for me, I just want a better day for my sons and my daughters. And when I look at it, my vote goes to the person who can inspire change, mm -hmm. right? What do you need or, or, or what would you say is missing in the campaign right now? Or what would you like uh, more of uh, where you are um, in the election? So you hear about this enthusiasm gap. There is an enthusiasm gap. There's a trust gap. Mm -hmm. People don't trust that politicians are gonna do what they say. They don't trust that things are going to change. And what I want people to do is to trust one more time. I want them to look at my record, look at what I did in the four years when I didn't have the job, look at what I did for the 15 years before I ran for the job. My life has been about how do we help make lives better for other people. And even if you aren't into politics, I remind people, you may not be into politics, and I don't mean you, but right. I, I hear young people, oh, I'm not into politics. Well, politics is into you, and politics is a stalker. Right. <laughs> it's gonna find you, it's gonna figure out what your child is doing. And it's going to decide whether your son has real opportunities or not. It's going to decide whether your mom, when she gets sick, can go to a doctor or not. I wanna be governor because I want to make certain that some of these things that we shouldn't have to focus on ourselves actually gets solved. And right. so I need people to trust that there really is a path. What we've been missing, at least for the last 20 years in Georgia, sometimes has been a person who actually sees us. Right. And so I'm talking to everyone. There's been a lot of conversation about me reaching out to black men. I reach out to black men because they have legitimate concerns and values that aren't addressed. And I want people to know I'm not taking you for granted. I don't take the Latino community for granted or black women for granted or white women for granted. I don't take anyone for granted. My mission and is to meet people where they are. And so what I need, one, I need people to read more about who I am and mm -hmm. what I've done. Two, I need them to make a plan to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, because even if you don't think it'll work, 
just try it one more time. Right. Uh, because when it does work, it changes things. And if you don't vote for yourself, vote for the person who doesn't understand they even have the right to imagine more. Vote for that child who is growing up in a community that may or may not value them. So even if you don't believe it for yourself, believe it for someone else for a moment. And then I need folks to just remember that this election is going to change the, the next 20 years of our lives. I mean, we, you know, four years can change a lot. Yes. And I need We've people seen to, that yes. firsthand. Yeah. <laughs> and so I need folks to understand that these four years at the state level will be the decision about what kind of liberties we have. Mm -hmm. We've got someone who currently has the job who does not believe in a woman's right to choose. He has been intentional about taking racial, basically making it hard to teach the truth to our students, mm -hmm. to our kids. He has refused to invest money in healthcare, even though we've paid the money and he won't spend it. He hasn't tackled the tough issues. And if you're okay with those decisions, then you should stay home right. or vote for him. But if you believe that we deserve more, then vote for someone who's willing to do more and who has proven that she'll do it. Right. I, I, it's two things before before we, we, we conclude. Uh, and I have to speak for my truth of my community, right? And we've all seen what has happened, whether in Georgia or out of Georgia, uh, as far as votes and things like that, the corruption and many different things outside of just votes. And I think the people from, from, from where I sit, we just wanna be heard. Yes. We, we, we want inclusion. We want equal rights. We want to be able to say, okay, it's like this here. Why isn't it like that there? Um, and, you know, whether you're brown, white, black, green, red, it doesn't matter. Right is right and wrong is wrong. And as a people, it's, you know, we want somebody who can stand on a table when we're not able to get to the yes. table to speak for us and i think i will like I, I just wanted to tell you that but let's 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 do some foreshadowing let's 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 use the most strongest muscle in our body and speak life over you know what we want and that's to be intentional let's say stacy abrams is uh the new governor of georgia what is something that you can tell the viewer to expect, what would be your what would be your call to action to uh, doing or getting done while you're in office? First job is to expand Medicaid. Right now, if you make more than six thousand six hundred dollars a year, Georgia considers you too rich for health insurance. Hold on, say hold on, wait. Yes, what? in Georgia, you if you make more than six thousand six hundred dollars, you are considered too wealthy for health insurance. A year though. A year. A year. Okay, we're going and to fix so, that. And so Medicaid expansion means that if you are working for $9 an hour, you're working full time, and your job doesn't give you health insurance, I'm going to make sure you get that insurance. If you're taking care of your mom because she's sick, and you can't work a full time job because half your time has to be, the current governor doesn't think you deserve access to health insurance. He thinks that's not real work. I have both my parents living with me. Right. That is work. <laughs> right. So I want to make sure you have health insurance. But it also creates 64,000 jobs across the state of Georgia, mm -hmm. so in every part of the state. And it helps us save hospitals. We're about to lose the Atlanta Medical Center, one of only five level one trauma centers in the state, one of only two in Atlanta. If it shuts, when it shuts down, we already know they're laying off the cafeteria workers. They're laying off the janitors right before Christmas. We could have solved this problem if the governor had accepted $12 billion that we've already paid for, he won't bring the money home because he doesn't think that people deserve health insurance. That's my first mission, because if you guarantee people access to being able to take care of their bodies. Especially in a time exactly, that we're living in. Exactly. If you can take care of your body and your mind, because it's also how we get mental health care in the state. Wow. If we do that, that changes everything. It, it makes it easier to do affordable housing. It makes it easier to invest in education. And we've got the money. We've got the money right now. We've got $6 billion in surplus. After we paid every bill, after we put 15%, you and I both know the good Lord only asked for 10. Yeah. Georgia does 15. <laughs> <laughs> Once you've done that, we've got $6.6 .6 billion left over. And I want to spend it on healthcare, education, 
housing and the helping small businesses get the same support that big companies get. Absolutely. I do those four things. I think I will have done a really great job as governor. Plus, I intend to repeal his ban on access to reproductive care for women. I just got chills. Listen, man, for the people who sees this, um, is this like a, a paid advertisement? I'm Cam Newton and I approve this message. <laughs> Take your asses you out there well. and vote. This is my platform. And uh, Miss Stacy, right before we leave here, we're gonna end with looking at this camera first, okay. then we're gonna go to this camera second, and then we're gonna finish with this camera right in front of us. We're gonna say one finger. One finger. One pinky. One pinky. One thumb. One thumb. One love. One love. By the way, socks are awesome. Appreciate you. I was just trying to get a little sauce. <laughs> that, 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 that Those socks are awesome. You know what I mean? A little sauce, <laughs> Yes, ma'am. That's it. Thank you.